tech lead for cellular support on Chrome OS. Uh, and today I'd like to give a talk about how we support cellular on Chrome OS. So um, first question you might ask is, uh, I didn't see a network you know, in general presentation here. Uh, so what's the deal with cellular? Uh, add your own slide fill, base fill if you would like. Um, so first, uh, what did Chrome OS start out like? So one of the initial thoughts behind Chrome OS was that the web had sort of taken over. Uh, you could do anything that you would like to do on your desktop or on your laptop um, using the web. So Chrome became your portal for you know, checking mail, editing documents. Uh, that was how you could become, you know, you could be productive using the web. Everything was stored in the cloud. Um, so the bet was that connectivity would be ubiquitous. You could find Wi-Fi in obviously in your house, uh, you could go to the coffee shop, um, and cellular was part of this plan. Um, on the right, you see a CR48, there's a SIM slot. We had a deal with Verizon where they would give people some free data and people could buy more. And this was the first Chromebook we ever made. Um, but as you can see here, uh, after that initial you know, bring up of cellular, there was a, a lull in the middle. And the team decided, well, uh, cellular is tough, so we'll stick with Wi-Fi and everyone has phones with good plans these days, so we can use uh, cellular data for people's phones. We can tether. And uh, the introduction of Arc++, which was Android apps on Chromebooks, allowed people to do more stuff offline. So these things put together meant that your Chromebook would be useful you know, pretty much anywhere. Um, and cellular support wasn't as big a part of the picture anymore. Uh, this strategy has pitfalls. Uh, phone batteries are not that big. Some carriers really don't like when you tether too much. And uh, Android apps maybe don't cover all the use cases. So in 2018, uh, we doubled back and we said, OK, maybe cellular support is something we want. So we started shipping uh, the Acer Chromebook 11 C732. And uh, since then, you know, OEMs love this. Their demand is out of control. <laughs> And uh, we are trying to bring up more new modules, uh, trying to get 5G support, trying to bring up lower cost modules so that we can cover all the markets. And uh, that is uh, keeping us very busy. So in fact, uh, how do we do this? We have to test all of these devices, all the different combinations of modules and carriers, and that's a lot of work. And the cellular team is not that big. So where do we get all this time? So as a you know, brief aside, Android deals with this by sort of turning the problem around. Uh, it ships, you know, the OS or the OEMs can take the OS. Uh, they have the HALs, the hardware abstraction layers, uh, and they can implement the different APIs for whatever hardware they're putting in their phone or their tablet or whatever device they're shipping. And so the OEMs take control of this. Uh, they do all the testing themselves for all the markets that they would like to ship to. And the Android team doesn't have to deal with a lot of this directly for most of the devices. Uh, but Android also gives up control of its updates uh, to the OEMs by doing this. And Chrome OS chose not to do this. So this avenue is not available to us. Uh, we have to do a lot of this you know, maintenance work and uh, testing and feature development ourselves as a result. So we leverage open source. Uh, again, we have a small team. Uh, so we have to you know, work with the community here to make everything work together well. So we take standard Linux drivers and uh, open source free desktop.org projects, modem manager with Domai, with MBIM, and we support modems with those. And these projects are tested across many different kinds of modems, and that helps us, or that eases some of the maintenance burden on us. So uh, my coworker, Stephen Bennett, uh, produced this graph of what the whole networking stack on Chrome OS looks like. On top, you have Chrome, which provides the UI. Um, and that talks to Shill, which is our general network manager that works with Ethernet and Wi-Fi and cellular, among other things. And uh, in the bottom left, you have WPA supplicant for Wi-Fi, which we're not going to get into today. Uh, in the center there on the bottom is modem manager and the cellular modem uh, as seen by the kernel. Uh, so that's what we're going to be taking a look at. So at the hardware level, uh, how do things look? If you have a dongle, um, you probably just have a plastic box and you have a USB port, and you just plug those things together, and you get online. Uh, for modules, there's an M.2 connector on your board, and the uh, module slots into that, and that's connected to USB or maybe PCIe, and that's how that's exposed to the kernel. Uh, for Qualcomm system on a chip, 
they have their own proprietary bus called G-Link. Uh, it's sort of like PCI, but there are some differences. So uh, as we uh, go one level up to what the kernel actually sees when we do this, um, suppose you have a dongle, um, you plug it into your computer and it's using AT commands. Some of you may remember this uh, if you used modems in the early 80s. Uh, this dates back to the Hayes modems. So the AT command set is a text-based protocol which uses serial ports. And uh, 3GPP, or the third generation partnership project that oversees you know, the implementation of 3G and later networks, uh, has an extended AT command set that modems are expected to fulfill. And so you get a serial port, and it also exposes a net interface uh, using the Ethernet driver usually. And then you can just open up your serial port using your favorite program, such as CU or Minicom or whatever else. And you can just start sending AT commands. And that's how you, that's one way to configure your modem. Um, so AT commands, of course, they're sort of the lowest common denominator uh, for all these modems. But the protocol itself uh, has a quagmire of vendor-specific details, depending on which kind of modem you have. Um, and also, it's not perfectly reliable, because a lot of features you'd expect from a transport, such as transaction IDs, just simply don't exist there. Uh, you have to parse your strings and figure out, oh, this has the same header as the type of the message that I sent before. So it's probably the right response. Uh, needless to say, we don't like that very much. So if you have a modem on a Chrome OS device, don't expect it to use AT commands. Uh, it's going to use one of these things on the right, either MBIM or QMI. So MBIM, or the Mobile Broadband Interface Model, uh, is produced by Microsoft. Um, it has a couple of advantages over AT commands. Uh, notably that its transport provides such things as transaction IDs. Uh, messages are uh, serialized and deserialized in a TLV or type length value format. So it's much easier for machines to parse. And uh, for one thing, the specification is also open. Uh, so this uh, is also good for us because as it's produced by Microsoft, if you want to ship a module on a Windows system, you must support MBIM. Those are the drivers that are available in Windows, so you have to use them. And so this means that a lot of mo uh, modules that we would like to ship uh, already support MBIM, and that's good. There's also QMI on the right. So that's the Qualcomm MSM interface. Uh, it fulfills many of the same purposes as MBIM, and that it provides a reasonable transport with, again, TLV encodings and transaction IDs and other such things. So MBIM uh, support is provided in the kernel via the CDC MBIM driver, and QMI is provided via QMI WAM. And both of those drivers give you a control port, uh, which is a character device. That's where you actually send your MBIM or QMI messages. And then a data port, which is the net interface that you actually are going to send packets over once everything is set up. The system on a chip from Qualcomm, of course, does everything very differently. Uh, the bus is very different for one. Um, so there's also another piece of hardware called the IPA, or IP Accelerator. Um, and the IPA exposes its own net interface. And if you want to talk to the modem, you actually open a socket. It's of type QIPC router. And this socket gives you a, a node on a bus called the Curator bus. The Curator bus provides a number of service discovery features. Uh, so you can figure out that there's a node on that bus that has the services you would expect from a modem, that's where your modem is. Then you can start sending it QMI messages as before. Um, and once you set everything up, you interact via Netlink to set up an actual data port on top of the IPA data port. So if you come from Wi-Fi lands, uh, this might seem a little bit weird to you. Because Wi-Fi does a lot more configuration in the kernel, uh, the CFG80211 layer, which, of course, you interact with Netlink. And this allows you to do a lot of different kinds of configuration for actual Wi-Fi specific features, for example, MAC address randomization. Uh, with cellular, the kernel is, again, much more hands-off. Um, it's basically giving you this character device. You can send your messages. And then um, it's taking its hands off. You, you have fun. <laughs> you make the modem uh, do what you want yourself. So modem manager ties everything together. This is what we use to actually do that sort of user space control. Uh, 
we take our high level operations and we move them into the lower levels by motor manager translating, you know, I want to connect to a network to, oh, these are the MBIM or QMI messages that we need to send to get there. And it's a free desktop.org project that uh, provides a Dbus interface that Shill uses. And we contribute to upstream for all sorts of like fixes and features and such. And in return, of course, we get all that stuff tested on a wide range of things. And uh, we get you know, the stability that comes with using an upstream project. And there are also helper libraries uh, for MBIM and QMI specifically. Those take JSON schemas of all the messages, and they actually do code generation to produce glib objects and serialization and deserialization messages, or functions, rather, for all of those things. So you don't have to do the dirty work of poking your TLVs yourself. All right, so let's get uh, one more layer above and figure out how Moda Manager interacts with Shill, our network manager, to pull everything together. So as I said before, um, AT, MBIM, and QMI, they're relatively low-level details. Shill really shouldn't have to worry about that. So Moda Manager, of course, exposing this Dbus interface. Um, it's providing this higher-level interface, and Shill is the network manager is what uses this. So Moda Manager exposes several different types of objects. So we have the uh, modem object, which represents physical modem hardware. That's your module, your dongle, uh, whatever else you have. Uh, SIM represents a SIM card. Um, there could be several in a particular modem, potentially, but usually that's just one. And uh, there's a bearer object, which is a little bit more interesting. So this represents a connection to a network. Um, Cell networks, unlike your home Wi-Fi network, are managed. So you don't negotiate IP configuration details via DHCP. Um, the network, when you're negotiating to register with it, assigns you an IP address. It tells you what DNS servers you should be using. And so those details are transmitted back to your modem, um, and your modem exposes them through this bearer object. And then that's what Shell can use later to actually set up the net interface and make it so that you can send packets. There's also two other types of objects. Um, SMS is something we only support a little bit. Uh, we support receipt of SMS because there are some activation flows that use it and some operators which use it to, for example, tell you if you're about to hit your data limit. Um, but otherwise, you can't send SMS from a Chromebook, so we don't worry about it too much. And the other one is voice calls, which we pretend don't exist. So how do we actually get online? The text might be a little small. Maybe you have really good eyes. So. Um, but it's, um, needless to say, it's complicated. So we're not going to get super into the details here, um, but I can give you the high-level breakdown. So before we had, you know, the modem is connected to the device, or maybe it boots up um, with the modem on. And some devices, a character device and a net interface are you know, produced by the kernel in response to this. Uh, modem manager is listening on UDEV. And so it gets ad events uh, for these devices. And uh, they can be associated with a specific modem hardware by looking at sysfs. And that tells them, oh, this, these two ports are part of the same modem. So then we have to probe the ports. Uh, as I said before, AT is just a you know, serial port protocol. Uh, so it could really be anything. So modem manager really does go in, open up your serial ports, and send you know, AT commands that are supposed to be no ops, but I guess who knows. Uh, to make sure, oh, yes, this is a modem. Uh, for MBIM and QMI, obviously, the process is a little easier. We have some assurances because of the kernel having already decided that these are the correct drivers to use. Um, then Modem Manager tries to find a plugin for these ports. So for Chrome OS devices that ship onboard modems, this is usually going to be the generic plugin. Uh, but if you have an AT-based modem that has a lot of vendor-specific extensions, your vendor may have written a plugin specifically for that modem to support those. But in general, if you have an MBIM or QMI based modem, uh, it's going to use the generic plugin. And so this plugin creates the modem object, and that modem object is exported to Dbus. And that brings us about maybe 60% of the way through this slide. So at this point, we can get to the higher level uh, aspects of actually connecting to a modem. We know the modem exists. We know it's a modem. Uh, now, Shill can take the reins, and it can 
see if this modem object disappears, it enables it. It says, oh yes, we, we want to talk to this. Um, the user can turn this off, of course, with the slider through the UI, but we're going to ignore that for now. So shill has a device object. Uh, it also creates service objects based on the IMSI, uh, which is the subscriber identification number that your, is on your SIM card. So if you look at your SIM card, uh, there's going to be a number printed in very small font. Uh, that's your IMSI. That's how your network knows who you are. And uh, for each network, there's also APNs, which is access point names. And shill has all that stored in a big database. And it shows that to the user through the network settings UI. So at this point, Chrome shows the user a little triangle, probably with an X. It might say like Verizon Wireless or T-Mobile or AT&T. And the user can click on that and say, I want to connect to this. So Shill takes all this information uh, that we have, you know, the APN information, um, and it pushes it to this modem.simple.connect method on the modem object, the modem manager. And uh, modem manager goes back, and it does a whole bunch of specific things. Again, the process is different for each uh, AT, MBIM, and QMI, uh, but Shill doesn't have to know about that. Modem manager takes care of that for us. So after we connect to the network, modem manager changes the state of the modem to connected, and we get a bearer object. So Shill notices the state change, and it can look at this bearer now, and it can say, oh, this is how I have to configure this uh, modem. So it gets the IP configuration details. It gets the DNS servers, for example. And then we can apply those to the net interface and set up routing rules. And then we actually get to send packets. We're online. <laughs> At that point, you can go, you can surf the net, you can uh, go on YouTube and watch your favorite cat videos. Uh, that is uh, how we get online. So uh, as I said before, we have a really tight relationship with upstream. Um, and we've actually contributed a bunch to there. You can look at the GitLab uh, for the free desktop.org projects and see if you want. Um, but we've contributed, among other things, continuous integration, uh, SIM hot swap support for many different kinds of modems, um, and Q router support, which is what actually allows us to support the Qualcomm SOCs. Um, there's various other features in here for up, like upcoming eSIM support. Um, and dynamic SAR is something that you need to support if you want uh, to pass regulatory rules, for example. So um, when you're uh, when you get close to your phone, it actually detects your presence. It says, oh, I need to emit at lower power, or I need to transmit at lower power in order to uh, you know, avoid uh, irradiating this person. So that's you know, part of regulatory rules. And now we have that support in upstream. Uh, and we've also added plugins for Huawei modems. That was, of course, back in the day um, before the 2014 cutoff. Um, but yes, we used to use AT modems at that point as well. And that's part of why we know we don't want to support them anymore. Um, and of course, plenty of bug fixes. Again, this goes both ways. Um, we submit bug, fi bug fixes to upstream, and uh, we get a lot of bug reports in upstream as well. So um, that's my talk. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, if uh, we have any questions, then um, I guess we can get started on those.
All right. Well, it uh looks like there's. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> How do we debug our code? Um, so this is sort of a tough question. Again, um, a lot of the code uh, lives actually in modem firmware and things like that. So we actually work with the vendors, of course, uh, to use their debug tools. Um, but also, Shill and Modem Manager themselves have a, a ton of logs. And of course, I said before that for AT commands, for example, uh, it's a human readable format, right? You could just see the strings, you can hook up to it with like a, you know, whatever your favorite serial port program is. Um, but MBIM and QMI, they're encoded in this TLB format. Uh, LibMBIM and LibQMI, of course, can deserialize this. So they can actually dump those messages in a human readable format as well. And this helps us to determine like what we're actually doing to the modem. Uh, so vendors can figure out, oh, is this you know, a problem on our end? Is modem manager doing something wrong? Um, so that is uh, that's you know, a brief overview of how we do this. Plans for 5G. Um, yeah, they're in the works. <laughs> I mean, hey, everyone's, uh, everyone's moving in that direction. Uh, so I don't know how much I can get into uh, right now for this, but part of the issue with 5G is that the current you know, buses that we use, like for example, USB, uh, I don't believe it's fast enough actually to max out 5G. So part of what makes these integrations very difficult is that we have to uh, you know, extend modem manager and all of its parts to look for all these different kinds of devices. And that's why uh, the Qualcomm SOC integration is actually, is a huge amount of work for us um, because even though it's not 5G um, or doesn't support 5G, it is on a bus that's, you know, hopefully going to get us there. And as a result, we had to spend a lot of time on that integration doing bring up, which for the MBIM and QMI modems, that go over USB or PCIe, uh, there's a lot less bring up involved in that. It's more just maintenance. All right. I'll wait another minute for questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, I hope that that was easy to understand. Uh, or I guess the other possibility is that I talked too fast and uh, nobody understood what I said at all. So that would be uh, unfortunate, though. All right, um, if that's everything, uh, then I'll, uh, I'll leave it to the next speaker. Uh, but I'd like to thank the Chrome University people for inviting me. This is my first time uh, giving Chrome U talk. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone involved. I'll see you next time.